ADAA welcomes you to the Brain, Body, and Sexual Health Connections, a mental health webinar. I would like to briefly introduce our host, Dr. Karen Martinez Gonzalez, who is an ADA member who is part of the Public Education Committee and the chair of the Women's Mental Health Special Interest Group. We are happy to have with us today Dr. Rachel Rubin, who is a board certified urologist and sexual medicine specialist. She is also an assistant clinical professor of urology at Georgetown University and works in a private practice in the Washington, D.C. region. Thank you to all the ADAA members, our community, and everyone who's joining us today for this webinar. I am Dr. Karen Martinez Gonzalez. I am the chair of the Women's Mental Health Special Interest Group from ADAA. And today we have a very um, special uh, webinar um, that we will be talking about the brain, body, and sexual health connections with Dr. Rachel Rubin. So thank you, Dr. Rubin, for accepting our invitation. And Please talk to us about what you wanted to bring to our members today and to our community. Absolutely. I'm so grateful to be here. It is just an absolute honor. I'm Dr. Rachel Rubin. I'm a urologist uh, and I did a fellowship in something called sexual medicine, which means I take care of all gendered humans for any type of sexual problems. And uh, often in our society, we think if there's a sexual problem, it must be all psychological. And uh, basically my point is that there's so much biology that goes into it hormones, nerves, muscles, uh, uh, body organs, all of that plays a role in sexual health. And so I work very closely with all types of medical professionals uh, and mental health professionals just to better uh, get people better quality of life uh, when it comes to sexual health. And so uh, I'm so grateful to be here and to be invited to uh, attend this, re this really important community because often mental health, right, gets put into off into a separate box and mental health is by biology. And we have to really all work together with medical professionals to understand the biology and how we can work together to improve quality of life. So I would love if you want to follow along on Instagram or Twitter or our Facebook at Dr. Rachel Rubin. Um, and, and again, really, it's, um, it's biology. And, and uh, we don't learn that much about our own biology. You know, I don't know about you, Dr. Martinez Gonzalez, I know you're in Puerto Rico in the United in, in the mainland over here, like I learned about sex this way, right? It was it was my male PE teacher that I remember in eighth grade. Uh, and the only thing I remember from that class was the word smegma, which is kind of funny because I'm a urologist and you know I ultimately became a urologist, but I didn't learn about my body. I didn't learn about what was happening. I didn't learn about sexual health. And then there's never anything beyond that. There's never anything more after that. And so um, where do we learn? Where do we learn about what our body parts look like, how they change as we get older, uh, how they work, how they function, how they drive. And so if we don't have education of, about that, we can't ask good questions. We can't uh, really get to know ourselves. And then you add a partner into the mix and holy hell, like things really get confusing and awkward. And then gosh, what if you have a partner who's maybe not uh, uh, the way Hollywood wants it to look? And then you have no script and you have nothing that shows you, well, this is what it should look like. And so you go to pornography, which is like the WWF where like nothing's real and it's all fake or, you know, it, and so where do we learn? And that's where I come into play of the communities that I work with of education is so important. These can't just be private parts to you or your doctor or your partner, right? This idea that, you know, nobody should know what's going on below the belt, uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's a body part like your nose or your elbow, uh, and we must get more comfortable talking about uh, genitals. And so you have to joke, you can't be a penis doctor and a vulva doctor and a vagina doctor if you can't joke a little bit and have a good sense of humor. Um, but, but really, it's important um, if we don't talk about our body parts and we, we, we have other words for them, or we don't even look in the mirror because we think it's like our internal body parts um, and, and our kids then don't know how to talk about it, right? And if we don't know how to talk about it, how are our kids going to know how to talk about it? And then if God forbid something terrible happens, they don't necessarily have the words in order to ask an adult or talk about it. And so I believe the key to 
a lot of sex education is just having conversations about it, right? Uh, talking with your kids while you're driving, you know, one minute every week of like, okay, you know, and starting young of this is your vault, like, like, let's talk about the names for the body parts, then let's talk about how they work. Let's talk about how they function, right? Just little kind of tidbit conversations over time, and you get everyone comfortable using the words and having these conversations. But unfortunately, that's not really what happens, right? We go to the doctor and uh, we, we, we think like we're like mechanics, right? We're like hiding under the hood and you don't know what we're looking at. We don't tell you what we're looking at and you feel very foreign from your own body parts. And I think it's a big problem. I'm a big believer that everyone should have a mirror in the office visit with them so they can see what their doctor's looking at. Um, they can understand, they can have the words uh, uh, for their own body parts. Cause then when something goes wrong, it's not just just, oh, it hurts everywhere. It's, oh, my clitoris hurts, or I have pain in my labia, Dr. Rubin, as opposed to, oh my gosh, everything hurts in my vagina, which is actually the internal part. And so we need better words uh, to communicate about this issue. And so of course we need comprehensive sex education. We need to do a better job. Uh, how in a one hour conversation is a gym teacher gonna cover relationships and mental health and uh, empowerment and body image and safety and gender? I mean, these are complex issues that we should be talking about all the time. And we need to, we, we need continuing education, right? As as people in the world, we need to constantly be learning and expanding our knowledge about what is comprehensive sex education and, and what do we know? Because if you don't know it as an adult, how is your teenager going to know it or your 10-year-old going to know it? And so we have to be talking about this. We also really need to look at quality of life and sexual health from what I like to call a biopsychosocial framework. You cannot remove me from my body and my physiology, but you also can't remove me from the way I was raised. Uh, from my uh, my relationships, from my social interactions, from how I uh, uh, how I'm educated, my religion, right? All of that makes me. And so, how on earth are your doctors going to know this in a ten minute doctor visit? How on earth are your doctors going to know everything there is to know about you and what your goals are and what makes you joyful and what gives you pleasure in a ten minute visit? And that is why I exist because I don't do ten minute visits because I believe people deserve the time and the space to really talk about their sexual health and their quality of life. And so again, um, when I see people for these types of problems, and it doesn't matter what gender you are, um, these are the kinds of issues we discuss. We talk about desire issues. We talk about arousal issues, sort of the blood flow to the genitals, like erections or clitoral arousal. We talk about uh, orgasm problems, like I orgasm too quickly, or gosh, doctor, because of my antidepressant, it takes me forever to have an orgasm, or I can't, I don't think I've ever had an orgasm, right? We talk about that a lot. And we talk about uh, pain or dyspareunia, which uh, pain can be, uh, gosh, I talked to a patient earlier today who had pain in his penis with arousal. I have patients who have pain in their vulvas or vaginas or pain in their clitoris. And so we talk about pain disorders uh, quite often. And it's really a puzzle piece, you guys, right? This is not like a one doctor in 10 minutes is gonna be able to solve all of your sexual health issues, turn a light switch on and you leave the office visit cured. It doesn't work that way. It's complicated. Now, unfortunately, because many of my colleagues only get 10 minutes, they think, oh, it's complicated. So we're not going to bring it up at all. We're not going to talk about it. We're going to avoid the topic at all costs. And I'm here to say like, that's BS people. Like we've got to talk about this. We have to advocate for ourselves. And sometimes you have to be the driver to decide who you bring into your team. Someone gave me this example recently of thinking of yourself like a fine race car, right? You need a pit, you're the driver of the race car and you need a pit crew that comes in to help you with the tune-ups and you get to decide who those pit crew members are. My kids watch Cars the movie and so you get to decide who your, who your team is to help you and you have to advocate for better, stronger team members. But it is not often one person or you as the driver who can do everything. And so I love my job because I am a team member and I help with the puzzle pieces, but people know that I'm not the person who's got the, the magic wand that makes everything better. And so we work with anyone we need to in order to help our patients succeed and thrive. And these are just a couple of our team members that we often work with. So in the center is 
kind of this idea of sexual medicine is a medical provider. Now, there is no one doctor who is a sexual medicine doctor. Uh, there are many types of doctors who may get extra training in sexual medicine. And so I'll talk to, to you about how to find one of those, but it can be a urologist like myself who deals with all genders and sexual organs. It can be a gynecologist who deals with a, a female body parts. It could be a primary care doctor who's gotten some extra special training. It could be a psychiatrist uh, you know, who's gotten some extra special training and takes an interest. And so we can't all do everything, right? It's crazy that we ask gynecologists to do everything when it comes to women's health. That's insanity, right? There's no doctor for men who does everything. And so similarly, uh, there can't be one type of doctor who does everything. So we often add in a uh, pelvic floor physical therapist. Remember, your genitals are just a bunch of uh, bones, muscles, and nerves. And so how they work, how they function, your orgasm is just a reflex that goes from your genitals to your brain and gives you a feeling of, of satisfaction and pleasure. And so sometimes there are musculoskeletal things that we can do to improve sexual health or to prevent leakage or prevent pain with intercourse or pain with erections. There are things we can do, and these are called pelvic floor physical therapists. Again, highly trained professionals and uh, not all pelvic floor physical therapists do all the things. And so sometimes you got to find the person who does the thing that you need. And then of course, there's the mental health professionals. Gosh, I, I met an ADAA webinar, which is the best organization ever because this matters. Mental health matters. And so we love, you know, if you have depression, if you have anxiety, if you have PTSD, like if you have trauma and so many people have trauma and trauma is not always in trauma, in my opinion, and, and again, not, a, I am not a mental health professional, but trauma is in the eye of the beholder. I have patients who have had very bad medical office visits where it's unbelievable trauma, right? A, a speculum exam gone the wrong way or a lack of consent uh, in the medical office. And I've also had patients have, you know, uh, wartime trauma, right? Things, unimaginable traumas, all trauma matters and all trauma should be addressed uh, with a team approach. Again, you have to find someone who, who, who will listen and take time with you and you must advocate for those team members. And so I put uh, the AASECT organization, which is the sex therapy organization where they focus on specifically sex therapy and sexual health. And it's a great organization as well. Um, and sometimes you get someone who really focuses on anxiety and sex therapy or depression and sex therapy. And so finding those right team members kind of to work with um, to figure out what your needs are. When it comes to finding a sexual health medical provider, um, I'm a big fan of ISWSH, I -S -S -W -S -H, which, which is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. Don't try to say that four times fast. It's very challenging. Um, I am the education uh, director or the education chair of this organization, and they have a lovely find a provider. So you put your zip code in or you put your city in and you can find, uh, and typically this is women's sexual health. Um, and then if you are a male listening to this and have questions, the Sexual Medicine Society of North America or SMSNA also has a find a provider directory that can really often it's urologists uh, as a part of this director. I'm on both directories. So if you're in the Washington DC area, um, I'm happy to help out any way that I can. Um, and if you're menopausal, uh, uh, often the North American Menopause Society uh, also has a find a provider, which can really help understand how, how um, after 50, uh, the body really changes and the, the hormones change. And so mental health can change as well. And so sometimes it's not just about an antidepressant and therapy. Sometimes it's about hormones, an antidepressant and therapy, right? There's many different things that go into understanding everything that is going on with your body. And you have to really advocate for yourself so you don't get siloed into these little um, rabbit holes where one person does the things that they know how to do, but that you need to see someone else who knows kind of what to do about other organ systems. In terms of um, mental health, I'm not gonna go into how to find a mental health professional on this uh, webinar, because of course, um, uh, gosh, uh, ADAA has so many incredible resources uh, for you to look for and to find a provider who just gives a crap. And they should, right? You deserve someone to care about you and to want to help you succeed. Um, you know, there are horrible things happening in the world today. And sometimes it's like, well, gosh, my libido doesn't matter. My orgasm doesn't matter. And I disagree. I think it does matter. And if it matters to you, it should matter to your medical team. And, and you really need to find people to help you advocate for better quality of life. And so 
uh, when I teach medical professionals, right, they, they all get so nervous. Everyone gets awkward talking about sex, right? No one taught me in medical school how to ask the right questions or what to say. Uh, and I learned over time that you just have to ask, right? Or as a patient, you just have to ask. You have to bring it up because no one else will because we're all so awkward about it. We'll talk about the weather. We'll talk about your mother-in-law, but like we don't want to talk about your orgasm, right? I think about myself. I've never been asked by a doctor if I can have an orgasm orgasm, right? Think to yourself, have you ever been asked to, by a doctor about your own sexual health? And so we're not asking the questions to our patients. And so I really, I beg the urologist, the gynecologist, the psychiatrist that I teach of just ask, don't be weird about it. Just ask because nobody else will. And so we maybe, and as a patient show up, don't ask at the end of your visit, make a special visit to talk just about this problem, right? Doing it at your annual exam, when you're getting your pap smear and your mammogram and all of these things, and you know, your doctor has 12 patients after you like not a good time, right? But say, hey, can I make another appointment where we can just talk about my libido or my orgasm or how my mental health is playing its role and I'm having a lot of trouble right now, right? Ask, it matters. If it matters to you, it matters, right? I have a lot of wrinkles in my forehead, everybody. You can see I have tons of wrinkles in my forehead, right? I could choose to pay to put four different kinds of botulinum toxin or Botox in my forehead to get rid of my wrinkles. In the grand scheme of things, do my forehead wrinkles matter? If they matter to me, then it matters, right? Then there's lots of, there's like 10 dermatologists outside my door who would be happy to put in uh, some botulinum toxin into my forehead. So it matters. If it matters to you, if your medications are affecting your sexual health, if your partnered relationship is affecting your sexual health, if your medical conditions are affecting your sexual health, it matters and it should be addressed. And I really um, uh, believe in that. So things your doctor might ask you, are you sexually active? Do you have sexual concerns you want to discuss? Um, we like to tell you that sexual problems are common, right? Make it normal for you that, that it's common. That doesn't mean you have to live with it. It's common, right? I am blind without my contact lenses, but so you could say to me, well, Ruben, this is just aging. Just deal with it, right? Just do yoga, deep breathing, and it'll be fine. Like I will never be able to see without glasses or contact lenses. And so uh, should I just sit at home and do nothing and not be a productive member of society? No, we use technology to make our lives better. And and so um, we can really, we really want to hear about these problems. And here's what I expect from my providers who I train is they need to give you time. You deserve time. And unfortunately, in our current medical system, time is not easy. And so sometimes you got to pay for time. Sometimes you have to ask for extra time or find a person who can give you extra time or a doctor who has the expertise who can do it in shorter amounts of time. Um, please uh, 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 let doctors, you know, as doctors, we should not be making assumptions. We should not assume the type of sex you are having or want to have. And so you have to advocate for yourself. You want to come in with, with your own ideas of what you want to get across. Do you have to tell a doctor that you're interested in kink? Uh, not if you're uncomfortable, you don't have to, um, but can you find a doctor who's kink friendly? Uh, can you find a doctor who it's going to be okay to talk to them about the things that you're interested in so they can understand your whole uh, medical history? Um, what else do I care about? I care about your past medical history. I care about your surgical history. If you had a hysterectomy and your orgasms have changed, well, the nerves to your orgasm probably lived alongside your uterus. And so we should be talking about that. Medications play a big role. We know antidepressants and, and anti-anxiety medicines can create sexual problems. That doesn't mean stop all your medications tomorrow. That means have conversations with your with your medical team about how can we boost sexual function and and uh, play this delicate balance between making sure your mental health is not um, uh, in crisis. Um, social history, right? I care about your relationships and your family situations. I care about your trauma. I care about your stress levels. That doesn't mean I'm going to say it's all in your head. It's not all in your head, people, right? This is biology, but it matters. If you have uh, trauma, if you have high stress, stress is adrenaline. Adrenaline contracts muscles. If your muscles are always contracted and tight, right? How are you going to mount a big response for orgasm? How are you going to feel pleasure if you're always, you know, having that stress? If you're running from, I always tell my male patients, if you're running from a tiger, do you want to have an erection? No, you're going to get eaten by the tiger. And so we have to figure out if you're in stress mode all the time, it's not always a good time to relax and have joy and pleasure, right? I want to know what gives you joy, 
right? What gives you joy? It might be eating ice cream. It might be going fishing. It might be having a glass of tea, but I want to find out what brings you joy because if nothing brings you joy, why would sex, why would sexual activity with your partner bring you joy? It'll just maybe be another thing on your to-do list that you got to get off your plate. I ask this to all my patients. I started doing this in 2020. Um, I'm a big believer that trauma is in the eye of the beholder, that not everything is trauma. And so I, I find that providers often get side sidetracked where if you say there's trauma, they just say, oh, okay, everything's due to trauma. And I don't like to do that. Uh, trauma is certainly a part of all of our lives, but there are many medical conditions that can create medical problems that can affect sexual health. And so I usually let patients tell me their whole story. And it is at the end of their long story and us going over all the details of their medical history that I ask them. And I say, I say, I ask all my patients this, regardless of your gender or why you are seeing me for today. And I'm okay if the answer is no, but I say, is there anything else cultural, religious, or trauma related that you want to share with me today as your, as part of your story? It leaves the door open to say, it's okay if you don't want to talk to me about this today, right? But I care about this. And I'm also not going to chalk your whole story up to whatever religious trauma, uh, 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 cultural experience that may have happened in your life. It's a part of it, but it may not be the whole thing. And so when I hear stories of sexual health conditions, remember libido, arousal, orgasm, pain, this is what my brain is doing. My brain is thinking biology and physiology. My brain is thinking what's going on in your brain, what's going on in your spinal cord, which interprets everything that's going on in the brain, and what is going on at your pelvis level, right? Is there a problem with your clitoris? Is there a problem with your vulva? Is there a problem with the muscles that surround them? And I really try to customize a treatment based on the patient that's in front of me, right? You are an individual that is unlike any other individual, and we have to get it right for you. I do the same things if you you have a penis, right? I do the exact same story. You just look at different anatomy and you under, and, but, but really we're all the same. We're all very much the same. And this is a book, uh, Dr. Martinez Gonzalez and I uh, remember looking at when we were medical students from our anatomy textbooks of that we all start out looking with having the same genitals and you develop either a penis or a vulva depending on your chromosomes and your hormones. And so I actually love that I'm a urologist because I can really take what I know about the male organs and apply them to what I know about the female organs and vice versa. And so the clitoris is no different than a penis. It's exactly the same thing. The head of the clitoris and the head of the penis are the same. The uh, labia majora are just the scrotal skin. The opening to the vulva is the same as the male urethra, the tube that you pee through. And bad things can happen to all these body parts, right? Real bad things and, and, and pathologies or biological conditions can happen in all these body parts. And so um, I go step by step. Okay, let's talk about the brain. Let's talk about the spinal cord. Let's talk about the genitals. And where can we make uh, the most um, impact for the patient in front of me? So again, libido is a very fascinating thing. And we could talk for hours about libido. And this is obviously not a, a webinar just focused on libido. But libido is, you know, for some people, they have innate desire. They wake up thinking about sex. They think about sex during the day, but many people have responsive desire where they don't think about it. But if a partner initiates or they see something sexual in a book or on a movie, they get interested, they get excited. All of that is normal, right? But if you are bothered by your low desire, then it's a medical condition, right? If you are bothered by your low desire, then it is a medical condition. And we look at it from that biopsychosocial framework. We know therapy can help. We know books can help. We know education can help, but we also know know that medications can help too. And uh, I always love looking at this picture because it explains the complexity of desire and arousal. And we don't need to go into all the details, but there is so much that play a role here. Dopamine, if I can boost dopamine in your brains, that can boost your desire and your arousal. If I can, that can be boosted through testosterone, through uh, estrogen and progesterone, through something called melanocortins. We know if you're breastfeeding, you're gonna have high prolactin, which is gonna inhibit this system. We know if you're on antidepressants, it can sometimes inhibit this system. So again, it's understanding the system or at least understanding it to the, uh, to the degree that we, any of us understand it and, and really uh, coming up with solutions
medications that can help. So we have medications that boost dopamine, right? We have medications that can boost hormones. So we really play around with this stuff and it's very elegant, but to say, well, it's all just reading 50 shades of gray, or it's all just having a glass of wine and then you'll be in the mood is really, really unfair and not true. There's a lot of biology at play. And so I always say, if you can say that antidepressants can cause sexual problems, then why can't there be medicines that work on the brain to boost sexual function? And we do have a few FDA approved options that are approved for low libido that work in about two thirds of people who take them, but it ha you have to be the right candidate and it has to be the right medical decision for you. Uh, and so I encourage you to talk to a provider who knows about these things and not everyone knows about these things. Remember, that was the first part of the talk, right? Not everyone knows about this. So a lot of it's education, right? We know there's a pay gap in this country. Gosh, we know women get paid a whole lot less than men, right? There's a pay gap in this country, but there's also an orgasm gap in this country. So for every orgasm a heterosexual man has, right? And he orgasms about 95% of the time in every sexual encounter, a heterosexual woman only orgasms about 65% of the time right? So we have a big problem with orgasms in this country where women are not orgasming as much as their male counterparts, even though they can have multiple orgasms. And it all has to do with education and setting expectations. If you give every heterosexual man in the world a stopwatch and he enters a vagina and he orgasms, about five and a half minutes go by, right? On average, it's five and a half minutes. Well, if you do the same stopwatch test and you give it to a woman, it's much higher than five and a half minutes, right? You're looking at over 30 13 minutes and 17% of the people asked have never had an orgasm. And as we know, penetration is not enough for orgasm for most of uh, uh, most women. Why? Because anatomy people, right? The clitoris and the penis are exactly the same thing. If a man rubs the inside of his thigh over and over again, he will not have an orgasm, right? He won't. It's close to his penis, but it is not his actual penis. Similar, the vagina is close to the clitoris, but it is not the actual clitoris. And so it's important to learn your own body parts so you can understand, well, what activates your clitoris, right? What activates your penis? What gives you that feelings of pleasure and orgasm? And lastly, you know, we see a lot of pain conditions. If you're in pain, how are you going to enjoy sexual health? It is a really big challenge. And so um, uh, there are so many different things that cause pain. We wrote a couple chapters in this book about all different kinds of pelvic pain conditions. And there are so many things that can cause pelvic pain. Again, really understanding the pelvis, its tissues, its muscles, its nerves, um, understanding hormones, right? Um, the vulvar tissue is incredibly hormonally sensitive, the opening of the vulva. And it's not just a story about estrogen, but we're learning it's also a testosterone story too. So if you're on birth control pills or breastfeeding or in menopause, or on breast cancer treatments, that may affect the health of your vulvar tissue, which again, if you don't have the right hormones, you will develop what is called genitourinary syndrome of menopause, where you get dryness, pain with sex, decrease in your orgasm, irritation, itching, burning of the tissue, pain with urination. This is actually not just about sex. Uh, women will get urinary frequency and urgency. If you know any women over 50, uh, make sure you ask them if they have urinary frequency or urgency, or if they're having urinary tract infections or vaginal dryness. All of this is because of a lack of hormones in the tissue. And we can see those changes with our eyeballs. We see the dryness. We see the, the labia minora literally shrivel up and disappear. My goodness, people, if penises uh, shriveled up at age 52, we would have vaccines uh, very quickly developed. Uh, but nobody talks about that after menopause, your genitals will change. And so it's really important that we uh, give treatment for this. And it's very safe. It's very effective. Uh, it's not dangerous. It can't cause cancer or blood clots or anything like that. And it's really just, uh, so if you are over 50 and having any of these symptoms, it's really important that we talk about local vaginal hormones to to heal the tissue and to help the tissue. And it takes about two to three months to work and it will only work if you keep using it and we can get it for as little as $10 a month uh, with online pharmacies by the Shark Tank guy, Mark Cuban has made a big difference in terms of getting affordable medications uh, for people. And then again, pelvic floor physical therapy can help with a lot of these symptoms to work on the muscle problems, the tightness, the pain. Uh, they are incredible at teaching you how to 
gosh, if you have constipation, if you have pain with sex, if you have frequency and urgency, they learn to teach the muscles how to relax. And so I know this was a quick whirlwind tour about how we uh, approach this puzzle, but it excites me. It makes me want to learn more and help more and advance science because there is so much we don't know. Even in 2022, there is so much we have left to learn. So I would love to hear more from you. I would love to uh, help find you a team that really uh, values what is going on with your life and figures out how they can help. Uh, please, uh, you can sign up for our website to get our newsletter. RachelRubinMD.com. Again, please follow us on social media so we can help uh, help advocate alongside of you to understand that these issues are so important. And I'm very grateful for the ADAA for bringing me today. It's just such an absolute honor. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. And as a psychiatrist, I must say that it, it's it's one of those areas that is just hard sometimes for me to talk to my patients about it. Like you said, sometimes you have so many things to cover and you know you need the time to be able to cover these topics. Um, and I was thinking while you were talking in terms of my patients, and I think one of the main things that they might bring up is like, well, this is just part of my anxiety or my depression or my PTSD. So why should I encourage them to talk more with a specialist in sexual health when this could be a, a part of the manifestation of their condition or a side effect of, of some of our medications. So what, you know, you, we already have so many appointments. Why is it worth it to have like an additional appointment? I think education is power, right? When you understand what's going on in your body, it gives you power to then understand it, advocate for it. And it hurts it hurts less, right? Like when you understand something, it hurts less. And so if you can understand how anxiety and PTSD is causing you some significant muscle tension, which causes pain with penetration or pain with orgasm, uh, no matter, or, you know, um, in any gender, um, having, we can do physical therapy and learn to relax those body parts. And you can actually learn to, to, to downtrain it. And so that takes work. Your psychiatrist is never going to teach you how to fully relax relax your hips and your pelvic floor muscles. And so that's where the team members really come into play. You don't know what you don't know. Gosh, there's so much I don't know, right? I know I know I don't know a lot, but there you don't know what you don't know. And and having consultations with specialists to say, well, you know what? Let me just see what they have to say or learning, right? There's amazing, uh, there's actually amazing uh, pelvic floor people on Instagram. It's a great place if you want to learn about pelvic floor physical therapy for free. Um, there are great resources out there. And just the more you learn about your own body, you can take control over it, right? Trauma, uh, I read the, the body keeps the score recently. And I think there was a quote in there that just said, the opposite of trauma is full communication, right? When you can fully communicate and you can fully uh, know your own truths and know how it's affecting your body parts. And then there's the idea that your trauma uh, doesn't care, like menopause doesn't care if you've had trauma, right? When your ovaries stop making hormones, like it doesn't care. It does it to people who have trauma and people who don't have trauma. And so you take someone who may already have anxiety or depression, and then you add menopause and it goes into overdrive. And then you say, well, this is just my anxiety and depression. Well, it might be your anxiety and depression on that, you know, uh, that uh, increase in that loss of hormones. And so understanding that there are medical things that we can really do to help, that doesn't mean we cure you, right? That doesn't mean, but, but can we, what is it, whatever cure means, like, right, we're all in this chronic condition called life. And so how can we just have more quality of life? How can we find you things that give you joy and pleasure and fun? Like that matters. Yeah. And, and I think what we're talking about here is that we, you know, our brains, our bodies, they're all together. We're a whole person. And we do have to start looking at all medical conditions as including the whole person. It's just as important for you as a neurologist to take into consideration mental health. And then it's important for mental health professionals to take into consideration sexual health. I think that's the main um, point that we're trying to make with this um, talk today is that this is just another part that it's important that we talk about and that we take into consideration and it can even be therapeutic in terms of your mental health condition. 
And I, listen, one of the most, the, one of the best providers you can find for yourself is the provider who is willing to pick up the phone and talk to another one of your providers or who's willing to work in consultation with a team member. And it's really hard when the docs, uh, the provider sees 50 patients a day and they're, you know, they just don't have time, but to find that provider who's like, you know, you, like, listen, I have a guy, I have a patient in Alaska so I'm in Washington, D.C., right? I had a guy come to see me from Alaska for a sexual health condition that nobody else was able to figure out. And how did he find me? His psychiatrist did research and found uh, uh, some research that we had done and connected us and then got on the phone with me and worked with me. And now I have boots on the ground in Alaska to help this patient. And I had this incredible uh, conversation with the psychiatrist who was open-minded and willing to learn new things and to try new things and to say, hey, um, I'm at a limit of what I can do out here. And that is the key. Like he doesn't have to be a sexual medicine expert, but he's a brilliant doctor because he He's really willing to go that extra mile for his patient and, and try to work collaboratively. Like not one person can do all of the things. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Rubin. We have all your information on the webinar, how we can connect um, with you. And I hope for our um, everyone who's watching, who um, is either struggling with anxiety, depression, or any other mental health condition, and who looks for ADAA for information, I hope this webinar just opens up a little bit about the importance of taking into consideration sexual health. So ask your therapist about if this is something that you need to do, if you need a referral, and hopefully this webinar will give you some ideas on how to take that into consideration in terms of having a holistic treatment plan that takes in consideration the body and the mind and, and everything that makes us human. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an honor. If you have any questions about ADAA, please visit adaa.org to explore our Find Therapist database, free online support groups, and much information about treatment options and diagnoses. Thank you and have a great day.